God, the universe, the afterlife, our future. This is a story of consciousness set free. Science has always believed that the universe exists outside of us. It is out there. Science has also always believed that our consciousness, that which makes us aware and knowing, dies when our brain also dies. Today, leading scientists are paving the way to challenge these long-held accepted beliefs. Neuropsychologist Dr. Peter Fenwick, based on 50 years of intensive study, makes the startling claim that consciousness persists after death. In fact, according to Fenwick, our consciousness lives independently and outside of our brain as an inherent property of the universe, much in the same way as energy and gravity. Boston scientist Dr. Robert Lanza goes even further, making the shocking assertion that consciousness creates the universe and not the other way around. In this program, we'll take a closer look at the work of these thinkers and the findings of other researchers which support the contention that consciousness exists forever. In this life, we often wonder what will become of ourselves and our loved ones. Millions spend their lives in constant worry and fear. We hear of wars and wonder when they will reach our doorstep. In the news every day are stories of death and destruction. It is easy to torment ourselves with fear. But what if death is not the end? How might we live our lives knowing that some part of us, our consciousness, the core of who we are, which makes us aware of our surroundings, might continue in some way. In the opinion of Dr. Fenwick, we've had it wrong all these years. Our consciousness is not produced by our brain. Instead, the brain is the mechanism which captures our consciousness while we are living. Originally very skeptical about the afterlife, Fenwick changed his opinion when a patient of his spoke about a near-death experience, which Fenwick could not explain. Through a series of near-death observations and research over many years, Dr. Fenwick has concluded that the mind is still there after the brain is dead. He further states, the soul and life after death are open questions. In a recent YouTube video, Dr. Fenwick says many people who have a near-death experience find themselves in a heavenly garden. 82% of the cases he's examined say there is a feeling of great peace and calm. In this clip, Fenwick also says there is increasing data to support reincarnation, dying, then coming back to life as someone else. We can conclude that some of the best scientific minds in the field have written comprehensive essays, not more than 27,000 words, on the continuation of life after death. And they have, in fact, enumerated different streams of evidence to support it. Well, what streams of evidence do you think would support it? What about reincarnation? Oh, no, people don't possibly know. But then you haven't looked at the data, you see. The data is very good, they do know. One illustration of Fenwick's assertion is the manner in which our eyes work. The human eye is able to filter 
and respond to light energy. But when our eyes die, that does not mean that the light energy also dies. It remains. The eyes, therefore, act only as a messenger. The same can be said of our ears, which filter sound that is always there. Dr. Fenwick has based his conclusion partly on the fact that there does not exist any evidence anywhere in the world that our consciousness is forever linked to our brain. In fact, science has no idea where consciousness comes from. The assumption is it comes from neurons in the brain, but it's just an assumption. And it's one that is increasingly questioned because there is hard evidence of consciousness existing after the brain and body have died, or in cases where the brain and body are paralyzed, seemingly dormant. The case of paralysis can be illustrated through something called anesthesia awareness. This is when a patient is undergoing a surgical procedure, but is fully conscious. Doctors assume the brain has been put to sleep with anesthesia, the brain is unable to communicate, but in fact, the patient is very much aware. Consciousness, it seems, has a mind of its own. Experienced Boston neurosurgeon Dr. Eben Alexander found that out in 2008 when his brain was severely impaired by a case of bacterial meningitis he fell into a week-long medically induced coma. He was said to no longer be conscious. But according to Alexander, the opposite was true, making the wild claim that he had visited heaven. He claims to have seen a valley of flowers and waterfalls and towards the end of his coma was surrounded by a multitude of beings all with their hands folded over their chests and rather than feeling fear alexander says the experience was comforting loving and healing he says it was not a dream because he had no brain activity Today, the doctor is a firm believer in spirituality and is convinced that a part of us keeps going after our physical body has passed. While some in the medical community have dismissed both his experience and his claims, others say they know that he is speaking the truth. Among them is journalist Leslie Keene, who investigated claims of out-of-body experiences in her book, Surviving Death, a journalist investigates evidence of an afterlife. She told stories of people who had been clinically dead, but were able to see the operating room from the ceiling, and of children who spoke about past lives. And what are we to make of Boston Dr. Robert Lanza's assertion that the universe is a product of our consciousness? Is it possible that the world in which we live has been made up in our collective minds? Lanza, who by trade is an expert in advanced cell technology, talks about something called biocentrism. Essentially, that life has created the universe and not the other way around. In Lanza's view, the idea that the universe just happened and that somehow it miraculously has the exact ingredients for life is not logical. He is troubled by the existing explanation of the universe, that it sprang out of nothingness almost 14 billion years ago in an event called the Big Bang. He says science has no idea where this Big Bang came from and makes the point that the explanation is contrary to what scientists actually believe, which is, you cannot get something out of nothing.
Lanza asserts that in order to understand the universe, we must first understand the observer, human beings. Starting in the 1920s, Lanza says we've learned that the outcome of an experiment can be influenced by the person who is observing the experiment. For example, watching light pass through two holes in a barrier can seem like the light is going through each opening one at a time. But without looking at the light, it's actually passing through both holes at the same time. This leads to the mind-blowing statement that if something is not being observed, then it does not really exist. It is only through the presence of an observer, believes Lanza, that an object takes shape. In this video clip, Lanza talks about the absurdity of conventional thinking in regards to space and time. What is so fundamental here, and to make this very black and white, right now science says that space and time are these whole hot, cold external objects. They're just this, this invisible matrix out there with no properties whatsoever and it just self exists. And of course, first of all, how can these things that you can't feel, t touch, or, or whatever, uh, just be out there? So that, that's cr a little crazy on, on itself. So think about it. If you wave your hand through the air and you take everything away, what's left? Of course, the answer is nothing. And the same thing applies for time. You can't put it in a bottle like milk. Space and time are tools of our understanding. So again, the light coming off here bouncing on me Right now, as you look at that, that's happening in your head. You're creating that space. That's not moving through something out there. That's a construct. It's just like when you dream. When you dream, your eyes can be closed, but you can be on the beach with the bright sun, and, and it can be just as indistinguishable as here and now. So again, your mind has the capacity to put this together, and that is what's going on. And, and I think we, we, we trip up because it, 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 it's not just black and white. You know, it's easy to say everything is just out there. Another scientist, physicist John Wheeler, held the same view using the term participatory universe, in which we are the ones who bring the universe into existence by observing it. Wheeler went as far as to say that the questions we choose to ask about the universe will dictate the answers we get. While many in academia disagree with Wheeler, Dr. Lanza, and Dr. Fenwick, their research, and that of many others like them, has created more questions and put long-held beliefs into question. But more importantly, they've helped create a sense of hope for all of us, that maybe death is not the final act and knowing this can help us lead more fulfilled lives in the here and now. Lives in which we discard hate and anger to make room for love and kindness, happiness and peace for our brief time on this planet.